Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to those who are in person and those who are online. My name's Jonathan Dooley. I'm a barrister here at Greenway, and I've got next to me the fabulous and amazing Carmel Lee, also a barrister at Greenway. Um, today, as everyone knows, we're talking about COVID issues in contract and property. Um, and yeah, I'll go first and may as well just get straight into it. So my section <sighs> comprises three parts. And what I wanted to do is recapitulate COVID together with some TV shows that came out during COVID. Um, so I've got section one being the Tiger King and COVID leasing regulations. Part two is the Squid Game and test cases concerning business interruption insurance policies. And part three is the last of us and business interruption test cases. So let's go on this adventure together. So part one is the Tiger King part and COVID leasing regulations. I never actually watched Tiger King, so I don't really know much about it, but I'm told it was a rollicking tale involving lust, lies, murder, plots, Joe Exotic, who's that guy there, I think, and tigers. The intertwined webs and plot strands that apparently existed in the show remind me strongly of the intertwined webs and strands of the various regulations that were passed by state and federal governments at the outset of the pandemic. One aspect of those related to stat demands and bankruptcy notice and other insolvency issues. I discussed some of those in a presentation that I also gave with Carmel a couple of years ago, and I think that was around the time that Tiger King first came out. In addition to the insolvency aspects, though, everyone would recall that there were various measures imposed by uh, state and federal governments in relation to enforcement measures with leases. And I just wanted to touch on those because there seems to be a, still a few cases floating around which uh, bring these up. So the first two I've got up on the screen there are the retail and other commercial leases, open brackets, COVID regulation 2020 which I'll refer to as shorthand as the retail lease regulation and the conveyancing open brackets general regulation 2018 schedule five, which I'll call the conveyancing regulation. Uh, so if you're in this territory of looking at whether you need to apply for rent relief or the like, or consider it, the first thing you need to do is figure out if your lease is a retail lease or not. Um, that's because the retail lease regulation being the first one there, applies only to retail leases, which was analysed by Justice Slattery in the decision that I've referred to there of Lee and Youth OK Proprietary Limited, 2022 NSWSC 1356, especially about paragraph 259 to 265. And to figure out if you're a retail lease, you have to go to the Retail Leases Act, um, particularly section three, and the description of activities falling within it. If you've ever looked at that, it's the sort of um, leases that you'll often find walking around in Westfield, for example, as opposed to, say, Greenway Chambers would unlikely be a retail lease. If your lease is not a retail lease, then that act won't be, that regulation won't be applicable and you'll have to look elsewhere to see if you can get some rent relief or other enforcement measure relief for COVID. And the next place to go is the conveyancing regulation, the second item on the screen there. So that regulation applies to leasing of premises or land for commercial purposes, which of course is quite broad. And there are some carve outs, one of which is retail leases, and I think agricultural leases and some other leases too. But generally speaking, if you're not a retail lease, there's a reasonable chance you're gonna be in the commercial regulation space. There was a challenge to the, to the validity of the regulation in um, a decision of Lambdo Holdings, which I've got up there, yep, the 2022 NSWSC 17461, and Justice Stevenson found that it was a validly enacted regulation, so that argument got rejected. Once you have located the correct regulation, the next step in your fun exercise is to work out the dates that you needed to apply. So, for example, if you are contending that a certain enforcement action taken by a landlord was invalid or in breach of the regulation, you need to be precise to ascertain the date of that action, whether it be by a letter or a demand or what have you. 
And that's because the regulations were changed about as frequently as Joe Exotic from Tiger King brushed out his hairdo, which I think is probably a mullet, just to go back to it. <laughs> and judging from its luxurious appearance, looks like it's been brushed out pretty frequently. So for example, for the conveyancing regulation, there was a version in place from 3 July 2020 to 20 August 2020, it's about six weeks. There's a second version in place from 21 August 2020 to 23 October 2020. Two, month, two more months, and then a third version in place from 24 October 2020 to 31 December 2020, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is you need to be quite precise in figuring out what's the date and which regulation do I need to be pulling up in front of me when you're working through it. Now, one of our favorite jobs as lawyers, of course, is poking around in historical databases to find the right version of legislation and regulations. It's just a joy. And fortunately, the fund doesn't end at the conveyancing regulation. That's because the conveyancing regulation, amongst other things, requires the lessee to have qualified for JobKeeper under the third set of rules that I've referred to there, being the Coronavirus Economic Response Package, open brackets, payments and benefits, close brackets rules 2020, which I'll call the JobKeeper rules. Now, to assess whether you qualify for JobKeeper, you have to go to those rules and work through them, and there's I'm not going to be cruel enough to bring them up on screen, but there's a number of different indicia and facts that you need to work through, such as a maximum turnover of 50 million and things like that. The uh, wonderful thing, though, is the JobKeeper rules were also frequently amended as the government's reacted to COVID somewhat on the fly, understandably, and different requirements came up in the JobKeeper rules along the way. For example, um, Clause 8, capital A, came not at the beginning, but a little bit through it. And even better, the dates on which the JobKeeper rules by the Commonwealth were amended don't marry up with the conveyancing rules. So, for example, there was a version in place from 17 July 2020 to 14 August 2020, just four weeks. And 15 August 2020 to 15 September 2020, another four-week period. And then 16 September 2020 to 3 December 2020. So if you've got a few different enforcement actions, you might be looking at two or three of the New South Wales conveyancing regulations, and then you might have to go to two or three more Commonwealth regulations and then make sure that the evidence or facts that you're looking at fits in the different schemes as they changed over time. So it's pretty fiddly. Um, and if it does come up in your practice, you just need to make sure that you're being pretty, pretty precise with what you're looking at and making sure you're getting the dates right. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're checking that other instruments that are picked up in the various rules are being looked at. For example, in the Commonwealth um, JobKeeper rules, <clears throat> they refer to the National Cabinet Mandatory Code of Conduct, SME3, Commercial Leasing Principles During COVID. That's the document that required landlords and tenants to have a compulsory mediation and other things of that nature. Uh, so again, you just need to make sure that if you do have to work through this, you're working through it quite systematically and uh, not uh, missing any I's that you need to dot or T's that you need to cross. Uh, the regulations and the like were pretty recently looked at by Justice Stevenson in the case I've mentioned, the fourth bullet point there, Orlando Holdings, which is a follow-on of the initial decision about validity, Orlando Holdings and Crocs, Franchising Proprietary Limited, number two, 2023 NSW SC 60. Uh, so that was the substantive hearing of the matter. That case um, was about a lease of a childcare centre by Crocs from Orlando, and Crocs had a franchisee operate the childcare centre. And um, during the lockdown, presumably the childcare centre didn't have as many people going or was closed. So Orlando, the landlord, purported to terminate the lease and sued Crocs for various sets of loss, including unpaid rent, uh, loss of bargain damages, and a refund of an incentive payment. And Crocs defended the case on the basis that the conveyancing regulation, the second item, applied so as to make the termination and the enforcement action unlawful. So that's how I was trying to get out of um, paying the rent and the like under the lease. And Justice Stevenson in that case rejected the tenant's attempt to do so basically on the facts. So he found that um, Crocs hadn't satisfied, that it met the requirements of the JobKeeper rules including for various critical fortnights, which were applicable to those rules at the time. 
and therefore found that it was not a quote impacted lessee unquote within the meaning of the conveyancing regulation. So the judgment um, contains a useful summary of the requirements of the various regulations, the conveyancing one and the JobKeeper rules in particular, and some analysis of the elements in it, and um, does emphasize the importance of making sure that you have your dates and your facts right and all the boxes ticks that you need to tick if you are to go down this path. So much like a documentary about murder for hire and exotic pet breeding, just when you think you have a handle on the twists and turns, there's always another surprise. Second part of my tour through COVID television shows and commercial elements is the Squid Game and the business interruption test cases that were in the federal court. Now, unfortunately, I didn't watch Squid Game either. <laughs> I was going to check it out one weekend during my 40th birthday when I was given by my wife a couple of days off from looking after the children. And instead, I watched this show called Final Space. Um, so it's a cracker of a show. It's pretty sci-fi nerdy, which I am. But if you're looking for some good TV to watch and you like sci-fi, definitely get onto Final Space. But because I haven't watched Squid Game, I can't actually offer an opinion about whether the test cases in the federal court concerning business interruption bear any similarity to a TV show in which there can only be one winner after a brutal and all-consuming experience, taxing all participants to their maximum. But the point, I think, is that after the levity of Tiger King and the leasing regulations, things started getting a bit more serious in the courtroom and how many people spend their evenings watching TV. The first test case that came in the federal court was a New South Wales Court of Appeal decision of HDI Global Specialty SC and One Canna, number three for Product Limited, 2020 NSWCA 296. That was a judgment of a bench of five judges of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, with the proceedings not having been heard at first instance, they were moved by Justice Samish Lark straight from the commercialist at first instance up to the Court of Appeal, before that enlarged bench, comprised of very experienced uh, commercial judges being Chief Justice Bathurst, President Pell, and uh, Justices uh, Ma, Hamish Lark and Ball. The issue in this test case, which was the first test case, was whether a particular exclusion clause applied to defeat the claims by insured persons for business interruption for losses they sustained during COVID. And in particular, the issue was focused on the exclusion clause in the insurance policies, referring to the Quarantine Act 1908. And the insurers said, the Quarantine Act 1908 exclusion applies, therefore your claims can't succeed. The problem that the insurers faced was that the Quarantine Act 1908 had been repealed and replaced in 2015 by the Biosecurity Act. And COVID-19 was not declared to be a quarantinable disease under the Quarantine Act, rather it was listed as a human disease under the Biosecurity Act. So on its terms, there was an issue for the insurers in seeking to rely on the exclusion which picked up the Quarantine Act. So what the insurers did was go to the Court of Appeal and essentially seek declarations that when the exclusion clause referred to the Quarantine Act, that should be read as a reference to the Biosecurity Act. And if that argument got up, then the exclusion would be engaged and insurers would be entitled to deny cover for business interruption to the businesses. The argument was rejected by the Court of Appeal, so the insurers lost test case number one. And in essence, the key of the findings were that the court concluded there was no absurdity in the insurance policies referring to the Quarantine Act even though it had been repealed. And they also found that the Biosecurity Act was not simply a reenactment of it, it was a different sort of structure. So um, the insurer's attempts to uh, uh, insert Quarantine Act were not successful. So in essence, what the Court of Appeal did was take a literal wording or a literal reading of the policy, apply the words referring to the Quarantine Act, and took the exclusion clauses reference to the Quarantine Act as being just that. And because COVID-19 didn't come up under that act, they lost. The insurers applied for special leave to the High Court, but the High Court refused special leave. So that Court of Appeal decision is the final word on that issue. Uh, apart from the exclusion clause issue, which is now essentially settled, the case has also got a good summary of contractual principles generally, and especially where 
a court can depart from the literal meaning. Um, for example, if the literal meaning of a contract would result in absurdity, um, court can depart from it in some circumstances. And if you have a contract of that type, uh, check out one counter because it'll give you a good steer as to where you should be looking as to um, the circumstances in which you can apply that sort of principle. So the first case only resolved that narrow issue. The first test case only resolved that narrow issue as to one exclusion clause um, and its reference to the Quarantine Act. So what followed were the second test cases, and those are the uh, two I've referred to in the second and third bullet points there. Uh, these were commenced in the Federal Court of Australia and heard at first instance by Justice Jago before Her Honour was appointed to the High Court. Uh, like the first test case, they were authorised to be taken by the Australian Financial Complaints Authority in accordance with AFCA's Complaint Resolution Scheme rules, and the insurers paid the cost of the policyholders. There were nine policyholders in the second test cases, which included businesses such as gyms, cafes and travel agencies. And these were much broader in scope in terms of the issues considered by the court compared to the first test case. So the purpose of the second test case was to have a range of policy wordings, so they weren't all the same policy, um, and lots of concepts judicially considered with the aim of having insurers and insureds and those advising them be able to get some guidance and be able to give advice and consider how different policies might respond to COVID having regard to these decisions. In the second test cases, there were four categories, or you can describe those four categories of policy wordings being uh, uh, that were considered. The first category is hybrid clauses. And these were focused on orders of public authorities, such as the New South Wales government issuing a lockdown order. And they provided cover for loss from orders of actions of the authority, which closed or restricted access to premises but only where the orders or actions were made or taken as a result of infectious diseases or the outbreak of an infectious disease within a specified radius. So the trigger for hybrid clauses was the making of the order or action by the authority. And all the hybrid clauses, in short, lost. And effect, essentially that came down to a causation argument because the judge said, uh, the public authority orders, and this is just a very broad summary of a 400 page judgment, the public authority orders um, were not because of an outbreak of COVID. The public authority orders were basically to protect people to stop COVID from spreading. And <clears throat> uh, the second type, uh, as opposed to this hybrid public authority order clauses, uh, was described as an infectious disease clause. That is, uh, at a clause they provided cover that arose from either an infectious disease or an outbreak of an infectious disease at a particular insured premises or within a specified radius. So for example, if you have COVID that's discovered at your gym, that might bite with that sort of clause. The third category was a prevention of access clause, which was um, provided cover for loss in relation to orders of an authority which meant you couldn't go to your business premises, either her honour held in part or in whole. Um, so preventing or restricting access to premises because of a threat of, uh, or because of damage or a threat of damage to the property or people, also often within a specified radius. And the fourth category that the insureds relied upon was a catastrophe clause, which provided cover for loss, where there was a civil authority trying to retard a catastrophe. Uh, the only, uh, in these cases, there are mainly agreed facts. I didn't appear in them, but the judgment of size are mainly agreed facts and Her Honor made some further factual findings. So the judgment runs to 391 pages and the insurers were largely successful. Um, the only claim by an insured that partially got up was from a travel agency known as Meridian Travel. And Her Honor found that the disease clause, that second category, uh, did apply to that but didn't make any declarations in Meridian Travel's favour on the basis that there needed to be further evidence concerning whether the disease itself caused um, loss to the travel business. She gave the example of if the travel agency could continue doing internet and phone bookings, an outbreak of a disease near the business wouldn't affect that, but it may affect walk-in 
if you get 10% of your revenue from walk-ins, the outbreak of the disease near the um, travel agency might affect that. So when I said in relation to Meridian Travel, I'm happy to hear further evidence about the extent to which the disease may have affected the business. Every other insured lost, and um, the Meridian uh, case is still before the courts on that issue. Uh, and the theme underlying her Honor's reasoning um, was, as I've just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the fact that most of these orders were for protection of the public, not really engaging with the elements required by the insurance policy wording. So there are quite a few interesting aspects to the judgment and it's uh, respectfully a very well written judgment and really quite, you know, despite its length, which necessarily was long, but easy to read and, and, and understand. Um, one, one interesting aspect to it was the insurers had another go at the exclusion clause in the Biosecurity Act in the first test case. And they ran that argument by saying, um, for policies that were in Victoria, there's a particular Victorian piece of legislation called the Property Law Act. And um, that permits acts to be read as picking up a uh, second jury enactments of the legislation. Um, she rejected that on the basis that the Victorian legislation only applied to Victorian acts, not to Commonwealth acts. And also said the Biosecurity Act was not a reactment of the Quarantine Act, similar to the New South Wales Court of Appeal. The second interesting aspect was prior to these test cases, there'd been litigation in the UK, which people may or may not have heard about, um, most notably the FCA and Arch decision. And uh, their honours in that case reached a different view and found that um, some of the policy wordings were engaged. But Her Honour said that distinguish those factually, including because the UK has a unitary system of government, not a federal system of government. And the radio requirements in the UK have, say, 12 miles radius. You can actually fit about 12 circles over the UK and get the whole territory covered. And she said, well, in Australia, if you have a 25 kilometre radius, that won't cover it. You know, just a different type of geography. And the third, well, a third aspect in which she distinguished the UK case was by the time Boris Johnson in between having parties um, issued some lockdown orders, the horse had voluntarily bottled in the UK and everyone basically had COVID and was already at Brighton Beach. Um, and here, Australia, obviously, we're in a different situation where it was more contained relative to the UK anyway. So some of the reasoning in the UK decision she picked up and applied, um, but other aspects she said, well, that's distinguishable due to the different circumstances. So that was that first instance. Um, as you can see in the third bullet point, there's a full court decision, and that's because five of the insureds appealed to the full court, which was comprised of Justice Mashinsky, Derrington and Colvin. Uh, its judgment was delivered in LCA Marrickville, Proprietary Limited, and Swiss Re International SE 2022 FCA FC 17 together with a separate appeal of Star Entertainment Group Limited and Chubb Insurance Limited, Chubb Insurance Australia Limited, 2022 FCA 16, which is an appeal from a decision of Chief Justice Allsop. In also a not short judgment of a mere 315 pages, the full court essentially upheld Justice Jago's decision to reasonably small differences were in relation to quantum which Justice Jago examined on the basis that she might have got it wrong, because as everyone knows, trial judges say, well, if I'm wrong on that, to help the Court of Appeal, I'll go and look at these other issues that would arise. So the full court said that if any of the shorts were covered, <clears throat> then you wouldn't deduct amounts they received from schemes like JobKeeper. Justice Jago, on the other hand, found that you would take off JobKeeper or some, not all, but some other payments from the insured's amount. So on quantum, that was a very minor win for the insureds, and it's a minor win because, of course, almost all of them lost on the question of indemnity in the first place. And the second issue, also a minor win, was as to interest. Justice Jago said um, if uh, indemnity is to be granted, I won't require the insurers to pay interest under Section 57 of the, insur of the Insurance Contracts Act on the basis that it was reasonable for the insurers to await the outcome before being on the hook to um, um, pay indemnity. And the full court uh, found that no interest would be payable from the date of, from the earlier date, um, if cover were 
available. Uh, as with the first test case, um, the High Court refused an application for special leave to appeal. So again, right now, um, those decisions, subject to what I'm about to say, uh, a reasonably final word on business interruption policies. Um, and if you do have a business interruption policy case come across your desk, um, go to those first, and particularly Justice Jago summarises all the policies in the different wordings, and amongst the nine, you'll hopefully be able to find which of the policies closely matches your one, and then you can kind of follow it through to figure out if your client, be it insure or insured, um, can rely on the reasoning, and hopefully it can. The cases, as with one canna, as you'd expect, contain, you know, again, a very useful summary of insurance law and general contractual interpretation principles, and um, in particular, uh, causation in insurance law, which is sometimes a bit bespoke, referring to proximate cause and, and what that means in insurance law. So if you have an insurance causation case, you can probably use these judgments to at least get a start on figuring out what the law is about causation. So the third part of my discussion is The Last of Us and class actions. Now I have watched The Last of Us. It's a pretty recent show. I put Matt Hudson, who's our technical guru, amongst many other things that he does around here onto it. And he also tells me that he likes it. So it's not just me. <laughs> the Last of Us is a story of what might've happened if in about 2003, the world had been taken over by a fungus that changes people into zombies. Um, that like to bite other people and infect them. It's based on an award-winning PlayStation game that I haven't played, unfortunately. Um, and yes, I am a sci-fi nerd. The two main protagonists in the TV show need to cross zombie field America, basically from Boston to the West Coast, venturing into what has become new territory filled with um, criminals, zombies, and other hazards. And... Thus, we come to the business interruption class actions. And I am briefed in one of them, which I need to disclose, which limits how much I can say, but I don't need to say too much because there's not too much happening in them. So with the class actions for business interruption policies, a number of claims have been commenced or were commenced prior to the delivery of the second test cases. Those cases, the class actions were effectively stayed um, or, or put on hold um, so that everyone could await what the Justice Joker in the full court did to permit everyone to assess uh, what common questions that may arise have been resolved and what common questions may remain. Uh, those class actions are now progressing in Justice Lee's docket and various interlocutory steps are being taken. There'll be some decisions coming out in the next few months. So all that can really be said about the class actions right now is watch this space. Class actions, of course, like any litigation often settles, so there may be no further judgments, but um, it also may be that some issues, depending on where they go, um, are the subject of further consideration by uh, the Justice League or some other primary judge and then perhaps the full court. And um, those decisions, if they do emerge, one would expect that they would affect likely a um, potentially, well, obviously everyone in the class and, and, and perhaps be of wider uh, importance to insurance law and the like. But I just wanted to pick up that there are still, well, the second test cases haven't um, at least yet resolved everything in this space and then there may be some further developments and of course there may be just some other more bespoke or uh, confined cases just involving single insurance and insurers. So, to give some concluding remarks, the world's changed in the last few years and there have been some good things and some bad things that have come out with it and missed all the, challenging, uh, missed all the challenges. It's been instructive for me to spend a bit of time looking back and reflecting and thinking about TV shows that I probably should have watched and when they were popular but are now passe and the horse is bottled. And I hope that listening to my presentation might point you in the direction of useful cases or regulations if a leasing or insurance dispute comes your way or at a minimum has given you some ideas or raised fond memories about COVID entertainment. And with that, I'll pass over to Carmel. And I'm happy to take questions at the end, by the way.
So I had a preview of Jonathan's talk and I thought his pop culture references were brilliant. Um, I was trying to think of some pop culture references for my part of the talk and failed miserably. But there is one way that I thought to summarise, or one reference that I thought to labour throughout the talk, um, and that is to Harry Potter. And Harry Potter's, um, in Harry Potter, Hangrod's three-headed dog called Fluffy. And the way that I think of these three courses of action is a little bit like the three heads of the dog. Um, when we look at contractual cases um, kind of coming out of COVID-19, um, a lot of these causes of action are being run as alternatives. And in a couple of the cases that I look at, um, you can see they've, how they've been used as alternatives in the one, um, in the one case. So what I'm going to do is touch upon a few cases in repudiation, frustration and force majeure. I'm going to look at um, how they've been run. I'm cherry, I've cherry-picked a couple of recent cases in the past few years um, that have considered these principles in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not going to go into great detail on each of those cases, but just to cherry-pick some of the key facts from them and how they uh, demonstrate that particular principle or where the law is up to in that particular principle. Um, at some point, I'll put out a paper with more detailed references and to those particular cases. But the idea is just to have a general sort of overview of this area. So turning first to repudiation. Repudiation is one of several ways that parties have tried to get out of contracts in the post-COVID-19 era. And of course, it occurs when one party abandons the obligations under the contract and they demonstrate that they're unwilling or they're unable to perform the obligations under that contract. Um, something that comes out of the recent cases is that it really needs an objective uh, look at that party's behaviour. Objectively speaking, did it convey um, an unwillingness or unwillingness or inability to perform its obligations underneath the contract, or that it's going to fulfil them in a radically different way. Um, if a party believes that another party has repudiated under the contract, of course, it has two choices. It can either continue with the contract or it can accept the repudiation and terminate the contract. In this, unlike the other two causes of action, there might be a possibility of damages as well. Uh, and the quote there from Jane Z. Holdings, which I'll refer to later on as well in this talk, I found quite useful. That a finding of repudiation is based not upon an inquiry into a subjective state of mind of a party in default, but upon an objective assessment of whether the conduct of that party can base the other side an inability or unwillingness to perform its obligations under the contract or fulfil those obligations in a manner that's substantially different to what they'd promised to do. So now we'll have a look at a couple of examples of what we mean by, um, objectively speaking, what might be repudiatory conduct or not. The first of those is Carter and Mamet, um, and that raised the question, is an inadequate response to a purchaser's questions repudiatory conduct or not? In that case, the appellant sought a requisition of title. They claimed the respondents didn't sufficiently respond to their um, questions about the contract. And the court ruled that the respondent did respond adequate, adequately, but the questions were quite vague. Uh, and that meant that the respondents didn't repudiate. And the vendors were deemed not to have repudiated the contract because they had a reasonable basis to maintain the contract. Hong and Gua um, applied Carter Mehmet above and with approval. And it considered whether um, a notice to complete, can that be repudiation of contract? Uh, in that case, it considered whether a reasonable person would assume the particular action taken by another party, is that deliberate or is that an inadvertent? And is it repudiatory conduct? And repudiatory conduct was found not to have occurred in this particular case. In this case, Hong, contract, Hong contracted with Gure to purchase two strata properties. The sale wasn't completed by the date of settlement. Gure issued a notice to complete. That notice was slightly defective and Hong didn't comply with that notice to complete. Gua then notified Hong that he's terminated the contract. Hong then claims that Gua has repudiated the contract and that he's accepted the repudiation. The Court of Appeal found the notice to complete was not a repudiation of the contract, but rather it's an assertion of the vendor's intention or capacity to complete that contract. I think, going back to sort of first principles, we'll think logically about that, the decision's quite reasonable. Um, you want to pursue that particular contract Jane Z Holdings, who, which I quoted from earlier, um, is a case that asks what damages do you want? Um, in that case, both parties claim that the other one had repudiated the contract, and it's a fairly good summary of the law in this area. 
The defendants alleged the contract was terminated once the plaintiff failed to complete um, after a notice that was dated in July of 2021. The plaintiff disputed that the validity of that notice and purported to terminate on the basis that the defendant had apparently wrongfully repudiated the contract. The defendant's termination of the contract was found to be wrongful and it constituted repudiation. Um, the court asked, was there consequential relief that was being sought? And because there was no claim made for consequential relief, the deposit was, um, the only relief was the return of the deposit. Uh, so it gives a good example that if you're going to look at repudiation and you're going to run that in a case, does that lead to damages? And if so, how are you going to calculate those damages? What do you want when you um, run this case? I think there's a missed opportunity in JNC Holdings. Um, HTH, I find, is a great case that um, really reiterates read your contract. <laughs> if you're going to act upon your contract, make sure you've read your contract and understand how it operates. Um, what's required to terminate your contract? Um, and if you because if you terminate your contract incorrectly, that in itself can be reputatory conduct and you could open yourself up to damages. And H2H is a great example of that. Uh, so in this case, repudiation was by action. HDH was about the lease of a car park in Sydney, and both parties submitted that the lease was terminated in June 2020. The lease briefly was in relation, um, had a clause that uh, the lessee's use, enjoyment, or trade or business, um, if it was if that was restricted or materially affected by reason of law or policy, etc., then the lessee should be entitled to a reduction of the base rent in proportion to the loss of damage caused by lessee. Um, Jonathan's talked about some of the statutory regimes in these areas, uh, but a good part of the case was about an argument of what, how the rent was to be reduced or not. But the what I want to focus on is. Um, what we think of the repudiation. Uh, so in March 2020, Secure raises concerns with HTH. They say, look, the car park's not as profitable for obvious reasons because of the various public health orders. Um, and they request to invoke that particular clause in relation to a reduction of the rent. Uh, negotiations continue. Uh, HTH eventually repossesses the car park. Thompson Gear, on behalf of Secure, writes to HTH and says that's reputatory conduct. Um, and we accept the repudiation of the contract. Um, significantly, the lease agreement contained a um, clause that said uh, that a party wasn't able to terminate the lease unless they'd gone through a, a dispute, dispute resolution process. So they'd moved to terminate the lease without going through that dispute resolution process. And as a result, um, they hadn't properly terminated that lease. But in re-entering the premises to terminate the lease, they had conducted that evidence, repeated through conduct, that demonstrated they no longer intended to be bound by the, by the lease. So in trying to, they think they're acting to terminate the lease. In actual fact, that action in itself has become repeated through conduct um, and they leave themselves open to damages in that situation. Sentinel Orange Homemaker and in the matter of Davies Investment Group is a great case that um, I, I think really ensure that your expert, if you're going to lead expert evidence, make sure your expert says what you, you know, it supports your claim. Um, and in this case, the expert's evidence didn't support a claim for damages. Um, so it's another good case of repudiation in the context of purchasing property. Uh, in this case, Sentinel contracted to sell a property in Orange to Davis Investment Groups and Davis Investment Group reported to terminate that contract because of the difficulty that it was facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Sentinel commence, commences proceedings to recover a deposit that's paid to David Investment Group. Um, and David, the David Investment Group then claims that there, that, uh, that termination has uh, led to a repudiation of the contract. And as a result, um, Sentinel's entitled to recover the deposit plus damages. Sentinel, this is the key point of why I've included this case rather than going through the, the facts in great detail. Sentinel claims damages and the damages that it claims is because it says in, since they've tried to sell this property, the property is diminished in value. Now, as we know, a lot of property actually dramatically increased in value during the COVID pandemic and that the expert evidence didn't support the view uh, that the property decreased in the, during the pandemic. So if you're going to say, these are my damages and there's expert evidence on that, make sure your ex that your expert evidence supports your claim. There was, they couldn't demonstrate their damages in that situation. Tour Squad um, 
is another great case about repudiation. In this case, it's a little bit different to the previous cases in that it's looking at um, if there is repudiatory conduct, you've got to be very clear if you accept that or not, or if you're going to allow the contract to keep to remain on foot. In Tour Squad, I feel very sorry for a particular manager because they had a real brat of a former. Um, the, in this case, uh, the appellant was a music entertainment promoter. The respondent was a management company. The, uh, the appellant arranged a tour for the respondent's client. The respondent's client failed to perform any of their contractual obligations. Uh, and as a result, the court found, that, well, this is a repudiation of contract. They haven't, confer- they haven't performed any of their obligations underneath that contract. And it gives, gave the appellant the right to repudiate that contract, to terminate that contract, sorry. Um, however, the contract remained on foot. Um, the tour company continued to send various documents to the respondent that were required to be completed. And as a result, the court found that there wasn't an exception, uh, there wasn't an exception, an exception to re- accept the repudiation of the contract. So they haven't, comp- they haven't performed any of their obligations on the contract. Very clear that that's reputatory conduct. They could have accepted that, but instead they keep on sending various documents. So it demonstrates that they're quite happy for the contract to remain on foot. Uh, and so as a result, they couldn't um, claim any damages in that case. Next stage living um, is a case from Victoria. Um, it's about the sale of land and the transfer of retirement village business. Uh, is another great example of needing clear action when we're looking at repudiation of contract. In this case, Next Stage and Ard Millen um, executed a series of linked agreements. By January of 2020, Ard Millen believed that completion would be impossible based on the original documents, whereas Next Stage's position was that they could still settle under the original documents. In April of 2020, Ard Millen and Next Stage spoke on the phone about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and their businesses. Ad Millen submitted that as a result of that pandemic, Next Stage, Next Step, sorry, had lost its enthusiasm from the transaction and had adopted a go slow position. It's one of a number of cases that are in this area where discussions around the time of the COVID-19 pandemic were then referred to by parties in litigation afterwards. In May of 2020, Next Stage served notices to complete and Ad Millen, and Ad Millen contended that the contracts were no longer on foot. They'd been terminated by mutual agreement between the parties based on that particular conversation. Uh, this, in this case, although Ad Millen submitted that those requests to negotiate could be repudiatory, when a, con- when a party is set, um, if in that conversation about renegotiation, you're demonstrating that there's an unwill- unwillingness or an inability to uh, perform what is required under the contract, then the rene- essentially it's um, we're going to renegotiate this contract or there's no performance. So they claim, well, that's repudiatory conduct conduct. But in this case, Justice Sacker, um, the court relied more on Justice Sacker's comments in Fishlock and their campaign palace by saying that a party doesn't repudiate its contractual obligations simply because it seeks to negotiate with, with another party about a variation to the contractual terms, especially when those discussions are ongoing. So what's the nature of the discussion? Is a there's a renegotiation or there's no performance? I intend not to perform my obligations under the contract unless you do X. Or is it um, that this is part of an ongoing discussion of, and the contractual negotiations between the parties? So I've gone very quickly through all those authorities, but I think this sort of encapsulates what I wanted to say out of those different authorities. In terms of repudiation, be sure that the other party has repudiated the contract. Um, or check what objective indicators there are to demonstrate that they've repudiated the contract. Um, check that there's a basis to terminate your contract and otherwise an attempt to terminate that contract may itself be repudiatory conduct and you might leave yourself open to damages. Check that your clients clearly accepted the repudiation in a timely fashion as well. And if your client wants to claim damages, make sure they've got evidence of the damages that's owing to them. What are the damages they're claiming? What's the evidence of those damages as well? The next... Um, Part that I wanted to look at, I've looked at previously in other talks. It's frustration of contract. In um, 2020, parties became very interested in the idea of frustration of contract. My comments at the time were, look, it's very difficult to prove frustration of contract, and I was on, 
it was very unlikely that a number of claims for frustration of contract in the context of a pandemic would um, would be successful. And what we've seen is that all of that's around the world in different jurisdictions and here in Australia, um, that's been borne out, those comments. So it's always nice when, you know, Barrister Tom comes along and says, I told you so. So, you know, clearly this is why I've included it in this part of the talk. Uh, so, of course, frustration of contract is where the circumstance of the performance um, would be radically different to what's it's causing what's going to be radically different to what's been agreed upon under the contract. So this is not what I promised to do. There's three cases in that. My favourite one of those is Taylor and Coldwell. There's a contract about hiring a music hall um, for a particular performance. The music hall burns down. As a result, there's no music hall for the performance to be in. It's a pile of ashes. So <laughs> clearly you can't perform that contract. Krill and Henry is a great one in relation to public events. There's a hiring of um, hotel rooms on Paul Mall to watch the king go past for the coronation. The king's ill, you can't, as a result, the coronation doesn't happen. So music room, the hotel rooms are still standing. The entire purpose of hiring those particular rooms is frustrated because there's no coronation. There's simply rooms watching an empty street now. Chapman and Taylor is again a good one for personal services. In that case, Cha um, the builder Chapman uh, is unwell. He's in a coma for several weeks. The contract was that Chapman himself would personally perform the contract. Alternatively, he'd be um, overseeing somebody to perform the particular work. There's no indication when Chapman's going to recover. As a result, the contract's been frustrated and Chapman's not going to be able to perform the work himself or supervise somebody else. The next few cases are all in the context um, of a pandemic and what they demonstrate is that where that illegality is temporary it doesn't frustrate the contract. Um, I think the first case illustrates this very well. It took, it's a Hong Kong case. It happened in the context of the SARS epidemic in Hong Kong. In that case the, um, the tenant had a two-year lease in a residential development. Uh, the, they said that because of a number of um, cases of SARS within the building they, they couldn't live in the building for a period of 10 days. And in that case, the court found, well, look, a period of 10 days out of a two-year lease doesn't frustrate the lease. There's a temporary inconvenience in that lease, but it hasn't frustrated a two-year lease. And that was borne out again in Happy Lounge, um, PTY Limited, a district um, court of Queensland case uh, in Australia in the Australian pandemic context. In that case, uh, there was purchase of business in Fortitude Valley. It's the main entertainment area. Um, in January 2020, a number of public health orders are made. As a result, of course, it's not a good time to own an um, entertainment business. So, as a, so they've claimed that there's frustration of contract. And the court found, well, there isn't a frustration of contract um, because, yes, they're they can't use that premises for a period of time, but it's a temporary period of time. Uh, the lease actually was up until 2032. There was an option to extend the lease for further periods of time after that. I think there are two option agreements attached to it as well. So as a result, it's a temporary period of time in the context of a much larger lease. Dico Hotels is a case about um, purchasing a hotel and various equipment again in the midst of a pandemic. And that had a particular clause that the vendor must carry on the business in a usual and ordinary course um, in regards to its nature. Uh, in, and yeah, there's a public health order. They're unable to carry on the business in the usual way that they would want to. They have claimed the contract is frustrated. Uh, Chief Justice Bathurst at the time says that they you've got to look at the ordinary mean and um, the ordinary terms of its nature, scope and meaning, but particularly, again, crystallises this idea in his judgment that where in illegality is temporary, the obligations are suspended, but they're not discharged um, in that lease. So there's no frustration again. Uh, the last one is an Irish case, uh, and it's again um, to do with the lease of a commercial premises. The party claim is that during, because of various... Um, public health orders, the, the lease has been frustrated and of course, uh, and they actually in their submissions they said the frustration is temporary in nature. Now, as you can see, that argument isn't going to go very far. Uh, the court cites um, previous authorities in that jurisdiction and said there's no concept of partial or temporary frustration um, on the part of it. So there's no t partial or temporary impossibility. Um, again, I like to just think of the burnt down music hall. It's either standing or it's not. It's a pile of ashes or it's standing. You can perform in it or you, or you can't. That's frustration. 
This um, case, though, bucks the trend of the other cases that I've talked about. It's a rare example where um, frustration has been successful in a particular case. Um, and the way that I crystallise this particular case is by thinking of how luxurious this particular property must have been. Um, so in this particular case, LBH was a company that offers luxury rentals. The plaintiff executed a booking services agreement for a property in Los Angeles. They paid the agreement was to pay $350,000 for a rental of their property for one month. They paid a deposit of 50%, $175,000. Uh, the agreement contained a, cancel, um, a cancellation policy, which is all deposits are non-refundable. Uh, it also contained a force majeure clause. So here's an example of frustration of force majeure being both run and considered in the one case. Uh, you know, two heads of a three-headed dog. Um, and that was that neither the company nor its affiliates or the owner are liable for any damages or injuries caused by conditions outside of that person's control. Um, and it names a number of different things, including regulation or government policy. At that point in time, there was a prohibition of people travelling to Los Angeles. Um, they were the plaintiff was told that rescheduling was not possible, the deposit wouldn't be refunded. Um, but they thought about the fact that the global re travel restrictions had limited non-essential travel. Um, it had also meant that it prohibited the operation of non-essential businesses or the private gathering of more than a certain number of people. Uh, so again, in thinking about frustration, was there frustration or not in this context, I think, well, how luxurious this apartment must be. Part of the contractual services was for a maid, a butler and concierge services. And it was found that the property was unfit for its intended use because the plaintiff wouldn't be able to utilise the property to hold the intended number of guests. You're paying $350,000 for a property for one month. Presumably, you want to show it off to everybody you can. And during these particular government regulations, you can't. So the contract's been frustrated at that point. Um, in relation to the force majeure clause, they said, look, that's great, but it only says that LVH is not liable for any damages, losses or injuries that's caused by those conditions. So they're not liable for any losses or damages caused by the, this government policy. It doesn't mean to say, though, that you can get that the um, tenant can get out of rent in this particular property. Uh, but going back to the luxury <laughs> nature of this property, um, the contractor was frustrated because that level of luxury couldn't be provided. Um, but there was no refund to the deposit. The plaintiff couldn't find any basis to say, looking at the contract, of why they were entitled to get their $175,000 back. Um, yes, I would love to visit that particular property. So we've looked briefly at force majeure. Force majeure, of course, has three main components. The definition of what, and it's a clause within a particular contract. Amazingly enough, I found one case where um, a party tried to organize tried to argue that force majeure is the vibe. There's a common law right to force majeure. It's not. It's a term within a contract. Generally speaking, it has three main elements. Um, a definition of what amounts to the force majeure, the statement of what steps a party who wishes to rely on that must take, and a statement of the consequences of force majeure. Um, for me personally, I became very interested in force majeure clauses when I was on holiday to the Philippines. I was stuck in a cyclone and uh, staying uh, after a very, very busy year of running a number of different cases. I thought, great, I'll treat myself, you know, myself and my friends will go to this fabulous luxury resort. And the luxury resort started arguing force majeure clauses, which is not the relaxing holiday that a contract barrister really wants to take. <laughs> and I was not very impressed. Um, so... A key feature of force majeure is that unlike um, frustration for, and repudiation, force majeure allows the contract to continue on. Um, but it, it may establish a process under which one party will inform the other that it's of a view that the force majeure event has occurred, um, and it might think of a particular way that it's going to manage that particular event. Um, so some recent cases in the area. Um, Aconda International and uh, Kiwana um, is a great case. The case wasn't decided on the basis of force majeure, but it contains some great discussion in this area. And it contains a great discussion of force majeure in a COVID-19 context. Uh, in this case, the plaintiffs um, had a contract for engineering, procurement and construction services for the construction of a thermal treatment plant. Um, the plaintiffs asserted that that was a force majeure event, pandemic had rose, and that impacted its ability to perform under the contract. Uh, and as a result, it couldn't comply with its contractual obligations. It found 
the effect of that clause was that if, it's in, if that clause is engaged, then the duties would be suspended and the right for termination or non-performance is extinguished. So force majeure means if we think about repudiation, where you say, look, I'm not going to perform what I'm going to do underneath this contract, this suspends the obligation that they perform particular duties uh, because of a force majeure event. I think it's particularly useful when we think about construction cases. Uh, so as a result, there's an extension to the period of time that they're to be to provide this particular construction work. It doesn't end the works, but it suspends the obligation to undertake those works. Woolworths Limited um, and 20th Super Place nominees is another great case about read your contract. <laughs> Please read your contract. Uh, and read it as a whole if you're going to look at force majeure con, um, clauses as well. So in this particular case, Woolworths suffered loss um, when its goods were damaged. Um, goods were on a train, the train gets derailed because of a flood and heavy rain. It claimed damages pursuant to an indemnity clause for the agreement between the parties. The defendant denied liability and it said it's a force majeure event. There was rain, there was heavy flooding on the tracks. We're not liable for this. But in that case, Justice Henry found that a force majeure clause fails to be, um, you need to look at the text of the clause in terms of the overall nature of the agreement. In this particular agreement, the defendant was liable for goods from the collection to the delivery of those particular goods. Uh, and that's expressed without qualification in the contract. So irrespective of how those goods are damaged. Uh, are damaged. So as a result, risk expressly is on the defendant at that point in time. And that's reinforced by contractual obligation that the defendant takes out insurance for those goods. Uh, so as a result, the defendant's unable to rely on the force majeure clause. doesn't matter how the goods have been damaged. As soon as you've taken the delivery of those goods, you're liable for those goods. And in the context of the fact that you're required to take out insurance, it's quite clear that um, you're liable for that. There's a limited number of Australian cases on force majeure. We've seen a number of cases overseas. I expect more cases to come forward in Australia considering force majeure clauses, which is why I'm talking about that today. Uh, so we expect this to be an issue coming forward. Um, the first case there, European Professional Club Rugby, um, is very detailed. The facts of that are fairly detailed about the contractual arrangements between parties. Um, and it's a good case about looking at the motivation of you of going to a force majeure clause and the motivation doesn't matter provided the reason why you've utilized your force majeure clause is valid your motivation for using that doesn't matter so in this particular case there was an organizer of a premier um, rugby union club they licensed those games to various media for media rights and then those games are shown in different um, jurisdictions in different territories both parties agree there's a force majeure event. The contract takes place between 2019 and about 20, 2022, so clearly that's, um, there's a force majeure event. Um, RDA terminates the agreement, and the other side uh, submitted that RDA's notice of termination was motivated by an improper purpose. Uh, the finding was that RDA was fully entitled to terminate uh, that agreement using the force majeure machinery, even if it's not the true reason for submitting that particular notice. It doesn't matter if on a true construction of the agreement, RDA was entitled to serve that notice terminating it with force majeure. It may well be that you submit that termination notice in a hope to, re to negotiate revised terms following a termination or to induce the other party to negotiate in a particular way. Um, but that doesn't render the reliance on a force majeure machinery invalid or ineffective um, or a repudiation of the contract concern. So provided you, you, you've utilised your force majeure clause adequately, your motivation for using that um, doesn't come into play. The next one is in relation to leasing of a property in Aberdeen. Um, it was about construction of works to be done on that particular property. The construction was to be concluded by January of 2021. You can all see where this is going. Um, the plaintiff submits that the defendant breached its duty of good faith. There were various plans and specifications that were given and they couldn't make up their mind about those particular plans or specifications. But the main thing that I wanted to focus on is the force majeure clause in this, um, in this particular contract. And again, it raises that fact that the force majeure clause was used to extend the period of time to comply with the contract, uh, so the contract remains on foot. Uh, so there was an extension of time. The force majeure event relied upon is the government decree. Um, so a secondary legislation in that jurisdiction was in lockdown. Uh, Post-lockdown, it took some time for, to return to normal. Um, 
and as a result the strict approach failed to be applied so there's an extension for nine weeks there's a lockdown period takes a while for things to return to normal so you get an extension of time for nine weeks the final um case there i included for fun to some extent that's the case uh in which the party tried to claim there's a common law right to force majeure and the court said it's not the vibe uh you really do need a clause for force majeure so I've noted a couple of points in conclusion of where I've looked at in this particular talk. Essentially, when I thought about this talk, what do I want to convey? And that is repudiation, frustration um, and reliance on force majeure clauses. They're all very live issues in, in the context of COVID-19. We're going to see these continue to come out through the courts, I think, in the next couple of years. And I think a lot of these cases are in the works. But most importantly, read the contract. I used to work for a um, New South Wales Court of Appeal judge and he would routinely say in the Court of Appeal to parties appearing before him, does the case really mean that? And I'm reminded of that saying when I look at um, this in talking about contractual clauses, does the contract really mean that? Um, think dispassionately about uh, the options that are open to your client. Think about your government, your client's actions. Think about the arguments against the relief as well that they seek um, before acting on the particular contract or starting litigation in that particular area. Consider running the three causes of actions as alternatives. We're seeing examples where the three of them have been run as alternatives. Um, the other thing that I've learned, um, I don't have very good pop culture references, but I did find out, I told my neighbour that I was presenting this talk, my neighbour got very excited, it's a computer program, and he said, oh, are there any great jokes about contract law? And I've discovered that there is a wealth of really bad contract law jokes. There are fabulous dad jokes on contract law. I think hilarious ones. I won't torture you with them at the moment, but if you want to hear any great contract law jokes, you can come and see me afterwards. Um, but there, is a, there are dark, dark things on the internet and very specific contract law jokes are there. If you want to have a look for them, that's what I've learned. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did Kiev wouldn't have any coronation? I think so, but my knowledge of history and royal history is not that good. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, on that case, uh, was that contract frustrated? Yes. Um, because the entire purpose of renting the rooms is to watch the coronation go past. I was, um, I was just wondering what they had to do with the owner of the hotel. I mean, I rent a hotel room and it's wet, so I don't get to go to the beach. Um, is it the, the scale, the significance of the event, or the amount that they are charging for the room that informs whether it's frustrated or not? I think it's because the entire purpose of the contract is to watch the yeah. um, coronation. A little bit like the Mardi Gras. From this point of view, the, uh, the hotelier or the, or the guest? I think objectively you'd look at the contract. Okay. Um, oh, because they know, they know why they're hiring at that That's price. right. So yeah. maybe if we use that in an analogy, the yeah. way that I'd think of that is, say, Mardi Gras weekend. Yeah. We've, got, we've just had World Pride. You've got a huge parade of Mardi Gras. Mm. Presumably you're paying an absolute fortune for particular rooms on Oxford Street to yeah. watch the Mardi Gras go past. Yeah. You're not going to be paying that sort of money on any other Saturday yeah. night. Um, the entire purpose of you paying that sort of money is yeah. to watch this all the floats go past. If that doesn't happen, then the entire purpose of you doing that is frustrated. Yeah, I, think, I understand that now. Thank yeah. you for that. That's right. <laughs> and one more question. Yes. Uh, with that Hong and Gui case, yeah. um, I, I was intrigued that uh, the issue of a notice to complete could be interpreted as um, uh, in any way uh, evidence of repudiation. Mm. Were they relying on some mischief that they'd, they'd by his stealth, um, included a, um, a minor defect, which invalidated It did notice. have a defect in it. So I didn't want to go in... I was conscious of time yeah. and I've been to a number of talks myself where, you know, when you hit 6.30, you, that large hook just drags you off the stage or the audience <laughs> just wants you to just shut up. So, <laughs> so I was very conscious that, um, of getting to time. But, yes, there was a defect in the notice to complete. And so the question was, was it a deliberate defect or wasn't right. it? Yeah. And as a result, is it repudiatory conduct? Um, yeah. I think it's in terms of a tax issue yeah. on the notice to complete. Um, and, and I guess if it was deliberate, then it would have been deemed to be an act of repudiation. That, that's what I was sort of arguing yeah. to some extent in that case, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's all right. Yep. A similar point. With, in relation to like frustration and it being permanent or temporary, mm. is that right? With the guy in the coma, not to be too morbid, but if it was like a coma, was, was there a discussion about like how permanent mm. the medical... There was. Oh, okay. So in that case, um, there was a discussion about it, but they didn't know how long he was going to okay. be in the coma for. So as a result, the, um, the contract is frustrating. You don't know... Um, and this is in the case of building works, how long are you going to be waiting for this person to recover from the coma? Um, so as a result, the 
contracted to prostrate it. And with the other COVID ones, was it because by the time you got to court, they got to court on those cases, that things kind of resolved, or was it it was all still closed? Which COVID ones? With, um, it's like, if it's like say the frustration because you can't access a property because of the COVID lockdowns, if that was the theory, was that it's temporary? Mm. Was it had it been ended at the time that you got? I think so. I mean, bearing in mind how long it takes for a case to come yeah, through exactly. to the courts, by that stage the landscape's changed yeah. and um, legislations have changed in that area. Now, it might have been modified in some way or whatever, but um, certainly it, it doesn't take the entire sort of contract. I mean, if we're looking at a contract that goes to 2032, yeah. clearly you can still use the rest yeah. of that contract. I hypothetically it was much shorter, perhaps. So if it's a 10-day contract and your entire 10 days, you can't use the property, yeah. for example. Yeah. yeah. But I think a good example of, of looking at that would be the luxury yeah, apartment the case apartment. where you're, you've got a month, the regulations are in place for that particular month, the entire contract is frustrated because you can't call the butler for a drink. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Or? No? Well, come and join us for a drink. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.